Um, I just want to thank very much um, the university. Um, it's a pleasure to be a faculty member here, and particularly in an environment that is really beginning to support research among faculty members. I want to thank the Health and Wellness Coaching Department. I know some of you are here. Um, and particularly for the, the um, excitement about research and also for some actual financial support for um, SurveyMonkey, for a survey-related study I was involved in. And let's see if this works. And I want to thank those who have collaborated with me on research. And I know there are a small handful of you here. And if you would just stand up to be recognized. Um, Catherine Smith is here, Rebecca Pilly, And Micah Saviet was here and is another of my research collaborators. Oh, he is here. Great. Um, so I'm going to. Um, Talk about why we need research in an emerging or not well understood field, just briefly. Then what is coaching? A little bit about ADHD and um, how that informs my own work in coaching. And then I'm going to use ADHD coaching research just as an example, um, a personal case study of why um, we need research, what to do about it, and then to focus in particular on what we need to think about in disseminating findings in fields like ours. And since I'm not going to talk about in great detail about my research itself, out on the table outside of here, there's some, um, picture, there's some um, pages of posters that have been presented on it. And um, if you want to look at journal articles, I can give you that there um, on, a, on a final slide if you're interested. Um, I do want to say that the, research, the reason I want to really focus on disseminating findings is um, because, number one, it's very infrequently discussed among researchers other than, like, what's the best journal to get my publication in? Uh, we usually do a study because we think it's important, so we try to get it published or presented, and it, a good journal can be a feather in your cap. Uh, maybe it can help you get promoted. But Really, what is important is what is research for? And for me, I think it's fundamentally about helping practitioners provide uh, evidence-informed services to the people who they are trying to help. And so that's going to inform a little bit about how we might think about dissemination of the research findings in our fields. Uh, the other piece of dissemination is uh, how do we help people in other fields understand what our field is doing and um, that there's evidence behind it so that we grow the reputation of our fields and understanding of our fields because they're not all mainstream. So uh, I guess I'm going to focus on dissemination, but I'll call it strategic dissemination when I get to that part of the talk. Where does this have to point? Oh, there we go. So why do we need research in an emerging or um, little understood field? One reason in my own field is that um, there are very few studies of coaching for individuals with attention deficit disorder, total N of 24, uh, of which two are my own publications. So I mean, let's say 22 until I decided I needed to just get busy on this. Um, there were several by um, a group of researchers who is no longer looking at this topic. Um, of the 24 studies, 19 were published in peer-reviewed journals. And among those, and this is about dissemination, only four of those are, are easily available to coaches in practice because they're f in free online journals. And all the rest, coaches in practice who are not associated with a university or a health center, um, might not even find out about if someone didn't make a point of um, helping them you know, raise awareness about it. So that is one issue I want to talk about in dissemination. Three of the studies among the 24 I'm talking about were dissertations. And the reason I was able to locate them was because of one of my co-investigators is at the University of Maryland. And he can get into dissertation abstracts easily. And that, that is also not something everybody can just happen to find easily. 
Uh, one of the studies was a conference presentation, and their slides were just readily available online. So Google Scholar helped with that. And one was described in a book. If you didn't buy the book, you didn't know about it. So there are some issues about dissemination of research um, that we'll come back to. So why is research important to me in my field? And I think this might apply to most of the fields here at MUIH. We really want to be able to demonstrate empirically what we observe anecdotally in working with our clients. Um, in, in some of our fields, and certainly in, in health coaching, there's a growing literature. In ADHD coaching, it's a very tiny growing literature. Um, that small body of research is not fully consistent with evidence-informed practice. So we need to grow research for that reason. And why does that matter? Because we can serve our clients better if we have um, evidence-informed practices in place. It can also help professionalize our field, help us be better recognized um, by other fields, especially if we're an emerging or poorly understood um, profession. So since coaching and coaching for ADHD are poorly understood. I'm going to spend a little time helping you know what they are um, before I talk about the research itself. But coaching is a profession that um, it doesn't have ancient roots like yoga and acupuncture, unless you think back to people have probably always tried to help each other figure out how to change their behaviors. But we're systematizing it a little more now than probably in prehistoric times. But in the 30s, the early roots of coaching started with 12-step programs and with, and this is a little embarrassing to say maybe, unless you like sales, that's not my field, sales coaching, like how do you convince people to do what they might want to do but might feel reluctant about doing. Uh, coaching gained momentum through the human potential movement, uh, adult development, leadership programs, and then an interesting thing happened in the 80s with the book you may have heard of called The Inner Game of Tennis. It started to look at how do you change behavior, not just by trying how you swing your racket differently, but by what you're paying attention to. And that's been really key in, in growing the science behind um, health and wellness coaching and coaching for attention deficit disorder. What kind of awareness do we need to change? What kind of new um, attitudes might we need to adopt? Or what kind of limiting beliefs might we have to look at in order to make that behavior change that we know is good for our health? So that was sort of the beginning of this looking um, at a different way of behavior change as not only an external um, external what? Not only uh, on the outside, anyway. But uh, coaching, oh, I didn't, I had a whole slide on that. I wasn't showing you, sorry. In the mid-90s to um, about 2000, coaching really came into its own. There was, were the beginnings of some associations for coaches. Coaching culture developed, and the first credentialing for coaches um, was put in place. Today, we have, as, as evidenced by our department at MUIH, and elsewhere, um, academic programs and coaching that are developing, increasing emerging research and evidence, the evolution of subspecialties. Mine, coaching individuals with ADHD, is a sub subspecialty, and there are not very many of us, but we're evolving, and continued growth in the field. So, you might also be interested to know uh, we're not a licensed profession like um, some of yours, but uh, there is credentialing available, and the first coach credentialing uh, occurred in 1998 with the International Coach Federation, and that's a generalist coaching credential. Just two years ago, in 2017, the International Consortium for Health and Wellness Coaching developed a coach credentialing process for health and wellness coaches, and it's, um, it's pretty rigorous. The exam that you have to take is take is uh, was developed in conjunction with the National Board of Medical Examiners, and if any of you know who, anyone who has done those exams, you have to lock everything you have in a locker. There's no note, no cell phone, no nothing you can look at, and you go in for your uh, multi-hour exam, and you come out crossing your fingers. But MUIH has had a number, uh, our faculty, and a number of our grads who have been successful in achieving that already, and it's such a new credential. 
Um, so now there are over 25,000 credentialed coaches worldwide through the International Coach Federation. And of course, this emerging practice of health and wellness coaching now has over 1,800 credentialed coaches in that specialty alone. OK, now you know about it, but what is it actually? So the International Coach Federation defines coaching as partnering with clients. And that's a big word in our field, partnering, uh, in a thought-provoking and creative process that inspires clients to maximize their personal and professional potential. And what this definition doesn't have is um, it's based on the client's goals. And you'll see that in some other um, definitions. The International Consortium for Health and Wellness Coaches um, defines health and wellness coaching as partnering with clients, and there's that partnering again, seeking self-directed, lasting changes aligned with their values, which promote health and wellness, and thereby enhance well-being. In the course of their work, health and wellness coaches display unconditional positive regard for their clients and a belief in their capacity for change, honoring that each client is an expert on their own life, while ensuring that all interactions are respectful and non-judgmental. I want to share with you, even though um, ADHD coaching is, doesn't have its own credential, we have an organization. That's, that's good. That's going in the right direction. And um, a couple of years ago, uh, one of the leaders in ADHD coaching uh, talked with many of the people in the field and pulled together this definition that we use now. ADHD coaching is a collaborative, supportive, goal-oriented process in which the coach and the client work together to identify the client's goals and then develop the self-awareness, systems, skills, and strategies necessary for the client to achieve those goals and their full potential. So that, that's what coaching is about. It's not uh, a content-oriented uh, profession. If you're a coach uh, in health and wellness, or if you're a coach working with individuals with ADHD, it's not about your knowledge about health and wellness or your knowledge about attention deficit disorder. Of course you want to have a baseline of that so you understand the issues your clients are bringing to you, but it's really a process-oriented profession. You're helping clients find their way through the process of behavior change. So that's really our expertise, behavior change process. Um, you, frankly, a, a, a very experienced coach could coach somebody on a topic they know nothing about because they know how to help someone clarify their own thinking, clarify their own goals, and figure out the steps they need to put in place to move forward. Um, as you heard from the definitions, co coaching is very client-centric. Uh, we consider our clients the experts on themselves, and we're in partnership with them to help them figure out the best ways to achieve the behavior change and meet the goals that they would like to arrive at. So we um, use processes that help support our clients' increased awareness, motivation, and ability to undertake, follow through with, and maintain self-chosen behavioral changes. So that's really kind of what we're about. Here's some things that we do. We offer presence, trust, unconditional positive regard. That's not particularly unique to our field, but we really have a strong emphasis about it. Uh, presence is a key competency in our field. We use positive psychology tools and strategies. Then, as, as uh, I've said earlier, you, we really support our clients in identifying their own wants, needs, values, motivators, and articulating their goals, and articulating their goals in a way that they can then figure out how to move toward them. We explore with clients what stage of change they might be in so that the actions they decide to take fit with that stage of change and are therefore more successful. We provide active listening and we reflect back to clients what we hear from them, whether it's their words, their feelings, um, things we've gathered that they've told us in the past that might relate so that they can hear themselves more clearly. 
We engage in Socratic questioning, which is really presenting a question to a client that will get them to think more deeply and more broadly about their own uh, goals or uh, where they are in life or the stumbling blocks they're facing. So that's part of our process. We encourage brainstorming as a way to come up with ideas if needed in terms of moving forward. And as part of behavior change, help our clients figure out very manageable, although challenging um, action steps, talk them through uh, obstacles and resources and supports, and encourage accountability and tracking to help keep track of behavior change because that has been shown to um, support the process of behavior change. Now you know everything about coaching. But I hope you know a little bit more than you did maybe when we started. I'm just going to tell you much less about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD. But since that's the population I work with, um, I just want to tell you a little bit about it. Uh, according to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, DSM, you may have heard of, the key feature is a persistent pattern of inattention and or hyperactivity impulsivity that interferes with functioning or development. And there are other criteria that have to be met as well, but that's the key feature. Um, in terms of prevalence, between 5 and 7% of children, different studies um, have identified as uh, the prevalence rate among children. We are increasingly understanding that ADHD can continue into adulthood. We used to think it was always, would always resolve, and that's not the case. So um, studies are showing between 3 and 4% of adults continue to have ADHD or discover it um, later in life. So I mentioned the DSM criteria, but recent research is really looking in much more detail at ADHD, and experts in the field grumble about the DSM because it really is not a sufficient explanation uh, for ADHD or a sufficient criteria for really understanding the disorder. It's a very complex disorder, multifactorial. Uh, one thing that makes coaching important, I think, is there's a high level of secondary skills deficits and comorbidities that can make it more challenging to deal with. And the, um, a researcher at a conference uh, I was at in January used this term suffering, and it kind of struck me. I wouldn't have chosen it myself, but the challenge of the human experience of living with attention deficit disorder can be huge, and um, it can impact relationships, educational attainment, employment, fatigue, exhaustion, identity, sense of self, and self-efficacy. Uh, in addition, there's recent research that really is showing that ADHD is an independent risk factor for health conditions, suicide, and other early mortality at a rate of a public health concern. So ADHD, um, even though the prevalence may seem small, is, uh, carries a lot of risks with it. For the, for the longest time, the only treatment approach was medication, particularly stimulants, and that doesn't work for everybody. There can be um, very problematic side effects, but increasingly, and this is sort of a, an emerging part of the field, the benefits are being recognized of a multimodal approach. And this is true in my population, but for health and wellness coaching, this is true as well. Collaboration between different providers and health and wellness coaches can really make for um, a much better intervention overall in what, whether it's preventing disease when risk factors are present or managing um, disease when the disease itself is already present. So part of multimodal treatment in ADHD has been um, not only the medications, but also therapy. But there's an increasing inroad in understanding that therapy isn't the be-all and end-all of helping people with their challenges in ADHD, because there's a lot of skill deficit. There's a lot of um, strategy learning that needs to occur. And so really, it's that behavior change, putting in play new behaviors that are going to make a difference for you, um, which is the skill set that coaching brings to the table. 
So that's just beginning to be recognized. The European consensus statement, they're a little bit ahead of us here in the US, um, mentions coaching, um, emerging research does, and some recent books by experts in the field looks at that as well. So this is my interest, research in coaching for attention deficit disorder. And I mentioned earlier why we might need research in a field like this or in any of your less understood or emerging fields. Um, so my question to myself was, a lot of coaches, a lot of coaches working with this population have no research background at all. So scratching my head, I do have research training. Um, what was I going to do about it? Conduct research is one way to get more research done. <laughs> so I'm working on it. Um, trying to get other people involved in it as well. Um, another challenge is this, the lack of evidence, which is kind of related to that, but we really need to develop that to um, optimize the services we provide, to optimize our client outcomes, and more effectively train coaches in the future. So uh, evidence-informed practice can promote optimal client outcomes, and this is sort of beginning... Uh, the beginning of where I really want to focus a little bit of time. Many coaches themselves, as I alluded to before, and this is probably true in any of your fields, um, uh, practitioners don't necessarily have access to current research. So um, how can they be incorporating that into practice? So this is a really big question, I think, for those of us who do research is, how and where are we going to disseminate this research so it actually is put into practice? And the other piece of that is, um, as coaches, we can get uh, bring in clients ourselves, but there are a lot of people we could collaborate with whose clients could make very good use of coaching. And this is true in any of your fields as well. So how do we get people in other professions to really understand what our field offers, what the evidence is for it. And I think research can really be a tool that we can all use to, to help our fields gain recognition, understanding, and respect, and then broader use through collaboration and referral. So I'm going to use some of my uh, own research as a quick case report on uh, the process of trying to get uh, research findings disseminated more broadly. And what I hope for you, because I know you, you're not going to be trying to disseminate the exact same kind of research that I am, but I hope it will get you thinking about how in your own fields, either with research you are completing or have even completed in the past or plan to do, what do you want to be thinking about in terms of disseminating the results so that you can support evidence-informed practice so that you can help people in other professions understand what you do and potentially also help consumers know that you're there as a field. Um, so one study uh, that I conducted was a descriptive literature review gathering the available literature. At that time, it was 19 um, studies and looking at what does that tell us about outcomes of ADHD coaching. And so if you want to know about the outcomes, you can pick up a poster from the table outside. But my interest um, tonight is really to talk to you about, so when we figured out what the outcomes were through this um, literature review, what do we do with it? And we really uh, wanted first, of course we wanted to get in the top journal in the field, but that's a different matter. But we, we really wanted ADHD coaches to know what we had found so that they could use that in their practice and then so that they could also realize that what they were practicing had been shown to um, lead to positive outcomes for ADHD symptoms and related disorders and, and in some cases self-efficacy as well, which is huge for our clients. So to do that, we were brainstorming. Uh, of course, we could present, and we did, at a uh, frequently attended conference um, among ADHD coaches. We also used our organization's newsletter 
just to publish a little summary of the study so that it could get out to coaches in practice who didn't attend a, a conference. Um, and the head of the um, research committee in the ADHD Coaches Organization, not actually um, a researcher herself, although I am now bringing her in as a collaborator on my upcoming study, um, because she is really smart. Um, she had the idea of making a flyer, like a one-pager that could be distributed at the conference, but that could also be um, linked to through the newsletter. So coaches could print that out for themselves. They could print that out to share it with other professionals. They could print it out to share it with clients and potential clients. So that was an uh, interesting thing I think we don't always think about when we're talking about disseminating research. Is what are the ways we can get that out to um, people in our field? I was also interested in disseminating the results more broadly as one way of helping the field be better understood and reach uh, potentially reach more people. So um, I really thought with my collaborators, of what are the kinds of conferences that we might be able to present this uh, poster about this research at that would draw a range of audiences? So, oh, well, we are so lucky to get this, um, our poster accepted to the American Professional Society for ADHD and Related Disorders. It's only about four years ago that coaches are making inroads into that very, don't tell anyone I said, sort of snooty research and expert in the field group. Um, now for three years, there's been a poster on coaching research and we were actually invited to make a presentation. Woo! It was in the basement room, the last presentation of the weekend, but hey. <laughs> Got to start somewhere. Uh, we also presented the poster at a uh, big health and wellness coaching conference in Boston um, when the Congress on Integrative Medicine and Health uh, was in Baltimore. Thanks to Stephanie, we, we knew about it, and put our abstract in there. And so we were able to have the coaching research um, be available for practitioners in, in a wide variety of integrative fields to become aware of. And also, um, it was going to be at the Pediatric Nursing Conference, but I got sick and couldn't show up. So, But that was another, another audience we wanted to disseminate the information to, because pediatric nurses come into contact with a lot of people uh, who have ADHD, kids, teens, young adults, and their parents who are really looking for what might help with the day-to-day -day life um, with ADHD. And then we've pre presented that research um, in a few places, and then we're, we're putting our thinking cap on now about how can we get that information just out to the public in general? And I'll, I'm going to come back to that issue a little bit later. Th thanks to MUIH, we had a wonderful uh, training in case reports, and the health and wellness coaching um, department we're trying to figure out what we should do, what we should focus our case report on. And I had a great uh, client we decided to work uh, with. Um, and so our case report uh, looked at coaching for ADHD in collaboration with, as part of a multimodal approach to managing ADHD, in collaboration with a psychiatrist. So that's very, a very interesting thing because even right there, it's you know broadening outside of our own field. So that research uh, is newer. We've already had a poster at a frequently attended conference by coaches. And I hope once it, the study is published, um, to get the, a summary of the finding in the ADHD Coaches newsletter. Um, we're really excited because uh, we're looking, by the way, we're looking this weekend at the copy edits before our um, article goes into the Permanente Journal. And the thing I want to say about the Permanente Journal, we, we talked a lot about where we might want to try to get this study published. And first, not a lot of places publish um, case reports, but there were options. I felt strongly, and I think in the end, we all agreed that having free online access to the um, research 
in a journal that also is indexed in PubMed and, and other databases, made for uh, a, a wide array of professionals to get access to that information. And we again presented a poster at a variety of um, conferences. Oh, I think there's one missing on here, but we're working on it. So um, that was an example in terms of thinking of where to get this published, of trying to be really strategic about how could the most possible people potentially see this um, study and the broadest range of professions potentially see this study. And we were very fortunate that the per Permanente Journal agreed with us that our research was brilliant. And so watch for it. Maybe in the fall issue, but it may be, I think it comes out four times a year. If I hurry up and do the, get it back to them by Monday, um, it might go in whatever it must be their summer issue. Depends on their um, how many pages they have. So uh, the most recent study I've been uh, working on, um, I presented a poster with my co-PI, sitting over there doing something on his computer, uh, uh, <laughs> research design for an exploratory mixed method study looking at how, um, how we, hmm, we fiddle a lot with this wording, but what are the communication modalities that ADHD coaches use when working with their clients? Which is, do you meet in person? Do you talk by phone? Do you use video conferencing? Do you use a combination of modalities? And this study um, was really important for a couple of reasons. One, no one has looked at this issue. And two, um, it has been looked at a bit in health and wellness coaching, but not in coaching for this particular population at all. And number two, uh, when um, I was presenting results of a different study at that hoity-toity conference, a psychologist asked, well, how do you know that coaching by phone is as effective as coaching in person? Because the trend is to do more remote coaching because then a client anywhere can find a coach. And a coach and client fit doesn't just have to be someone in your neighborhood. You can find someone you can really work with well. So that really prompted this study of what communication modalities do coaches use with their clients who have ADHD, and what is the perceived effectiveness of each modality. I would have loved to do a randomized control trial, but I didn't have the funds yet. Anyway, uh, you know we've begun to disseminate it because you had a chance to see our poster on the research design here, but to ADHD coaches, we've submitted um, an abstract about the study uh, and hope it will be accepted for the fall. Again, we're going to use the, our organization's newsletter. And again, I think the idea of a one-pager is good. But in terms of uh, broader dissemination, well, you only got to see the uh, design. But we got the results um, for the, from the first part of the uh, mixed methods study already presented at a conference, at that hoity-toity one. So they're really listening to coaches, finally. And um, an article is under review in a coaching journal, again chosen because it's free online access. So the majority of coaches could get that article and look at it if they wanted to. Um, and it also uh, happens to be indexed in CINAHL, which is, is a big database. Very fortunately, um, one of those hoity-toity experts was interested in our poster and invited us to submit it there, but I didn't want to do that because coaches wouldn't have access to it. But I think I'm uh, going to talk with him. I think he will be interested in um, having a summary of the study published there. So that's good because that's indexed in PubMed. So that reaches a broader audience again. So these are some of the ways I've been trying to think about how to be strategic in um, dissemination of research. And so I invite you in your own fields to really um, engage those questions as well. Yes, it's nice to be in a top-notch journal. Yes, our article was rejected. But then we got in a journal that was, had a much broader access. And it really got us thinking about, well, what is the point of getting a publication anyway? It's really to get the information out to the broadest uh, array of people anyway. So. 
My next question is really how to think strategically about getting information about our field and any of your fields out to the public so that they're more aware of what we do, what the evidence for it is. Um, so health-related magazines, other popular magazines. I have a collaborator not in this research, but um, in a, for a column I edit in another journal. And she thinks we should get something into like good housekeeping, you know, whatever, so people see it. Health-related websites, um, I'm looking at maybe writing something for the Psychology Today online blog. But then I'm thinking, hmm, how about the experts in marketing here at MUIH? Maybe we need to have researchers sit down with them. And how do we get our um, findings out to the public? So that's what I wanted to talk about, disseminating research, and to encourage you all to think strategically when you have a study, who do you want to see it and why, and how can you get it out to the broadest array of people who might benefit from it? So thank you.